Um, sitting right beside him is Gugum Sibi, she's senior head, public sector and government um, for Africa at Ernst & Young, based in South Africa. Gugu? Thank you very much, Jimmy, and uh, good, is it still morning? Good morning to everybody. I think the biggest challenge for me is speaking truth to power. I find that um, we, we have a challenge, and I'm, I'll speak um, later on in, in, in my presentation, I hope we will allude to that, that we, I find that we tend to shy away from um, challenging um, our governments and challenging our leadership because one, perhaps we're going to be muzzled, one, because we're, you know, we're not going to get the businesses, so we tend to just toe the line. So if not us, then who? Wow. Great. <laughs> um, of course, a lady who really doesn't need much introduction is sitting right beside uh, Gugu. Um, she's, of course, the founder and president of um, Foundation for Community Development based in Mozambique. And, of course, our much beloved Mama Grasa Michelle. Let me begin by being a bit controversial. I see a difference between leadership and positions and uh, visible positions of uh, power. I think we, we are, have been confusing many times the fact that if someone is in a position of power is immediately a leader. In my experience, Leadership comes with the very hard work. It comes with the humility. And actually, real leaders, they don't know themselves that they are leaders. People call them leaders out of the result of how they position themselves, how they work with the people, how they make an impact in people's lives, and that's when they decide that this is a leader. Mm. So it's not everybody who is in a position of power who is a leader, really. This comes with one, if I can say it now, this comes with a very clear and principled way of how you relate to others. I think Bongani mentioning that, how you relate to others with respect, with humility. It comes also with the, a very deep commitment to service. So you are not there for yourself. You are there for the people who you elected somehow to work with or to make an impact in. And it comes then as a result of very concrete palpable results in the lives of people, then they say, this is our leader. Absolutely. There are a couple of very interesting points that you make, and I'd love to come back to them, Mama Grasa, just now when we continue this conversation around uh, the current leadership and, and what it is that defines a leader and why seemingly that doesn't always translate, but I'll, I'll, I'll revisit mm. that shortly. Um, last, but Mr. Former President, definitely not least, of course, is the um, co-chair of the Investment Climate Facility for Africa, and of course, the former president of Tanzania is Benjamin William Mkapa. Thank you. I am referred to as the retired president. <laughs> Having retired, mm -hmm. you will see that my views are very retarded. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe the, 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 bas the basic starting point is leaders must be prepared to be led. The trouble is they take the aspects of command and control. Mm. They take their knowledge to be all-embracing, and they don't listen to the members of the organizations they lead or the countries they lead. At least they don't listen sufficiently. So to be a good leader, you must be prepared to be led by the organization or the institution that you do. If you are, then you'll be able to fashion a vision for the organization or the country that you want to lead. You'll be able to inspire the people and you'll, be, you'll, you'll find it very easy to guide rather than to command. I think the real trouble is we distance ourselves from the people that we say we lead. That is the big problem. 
Wow. I told you I was retarded. Hey. <laughs> I think there are many people in this room who are looking forward to other people being retired too, so that they can also <laughs> express their views. But, but if I can just follow up on, on that particular point, the notion of leaders being willing to be led. We can look across the continent today and cite numerous examples of leadership challenges that we face on this continent. So, Mr. President, if I may still follow up on that point, what is it then that is going wrong? Because when people are supposedly coming up through the ranks, they speak very much the language which you're speaking with right now. We have to be uh, willing to be led. We have to listen to the people. Inauguration day, suddenly, nobody's listening anymore. So what happens? You, you've been in, in, in direct, in the position of, of leadership leading a country. What are we missing? Why do people cease to listen? Because they think too much of themselves. That really is the reason. That if you are president, you are the be all of everything in, the, in that area. Um, where previously you were prepared to receive advice, now you think advisors are undermining your authority. Uh, that is really the problem. If, otherwise, if you kept in touch with the people you are leading, if there is a need to change the constitution, in order to produce security and stability, you will listen to them and you will undertake the task. If there is a need for economic reform and you can listen to the people, what they are complaining about or the kind of future that they see, then it will be easy to mobilize the, the, the resources as well as the people particularly to be able to fashion the path of development together. But uh, if, if, you, if you let power get to your head, you won't have elections or you will rig the elections um, and uh, you will say, this is the development path, and you better, and then you will organize to enforce, to enforce it, rather than to, to, to draw people into, into, into the development paradigm. I think that is the problem. Uh, so, have a good team to advise. And I think have, have periodic elections, not just uh, an election for a life presidency, no. Um, have consultations with all sectors of, of, of organized or organized communities, whether they are cultural or whether they are economic or they are political associations or NGOs. Th those regular consultations pull you down to earth. But if you just listen to those sirens that tell people to clear the way for you to pass, <laughs> then you won't get very far. <laughs> I'm really resisting the comment about the sirens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think my fellow South Africans will appreciate that particularly. Gugu, if I could come to you. You just had to, didn't you? I just had to. You know I had to go there. Um, the president says that we, we, we have to look at a situation where we uh, individuals are listening and continue to do so. What I heard in the midst of that was a challenge to us, the electorate, around who it is that we choose to lead us. What do you think, as a young you know, African, as a young South African um, and a YGL, what is it do you think that we are doing wrong potentially as the electorate when it comes to choosing our leadership? Because at the end of the day, by and large, the idea is that we, you know, you get the leaders that you deserve. Yes. Um, you know, to me, not to take away what South Africa has gone through, because I take it that you would like me to talk about um, the South African perspective uh, so not to take away what South Africa has gone through and how, we've, how we got to where we are. So, so, so um, I think I'm sitting here because um, of, of, of parties like the ANC um, and parties like Azapo, PIC. So I, I, I do recognize that humbly. I don't think, though, um, that I can honestly claim that we should be where we're at. Um, I, I would like a system that changes in South Africa where um, leaders are not appointed through a party because too often you get given leaders that you would not necessarily have chosen. Um, it's a bit of a controversial statement sitting here, but I do think that <laughs> a decision cannot be made um, for, for us by a party. We think, I think we need to, the only way we can identify our leadership is being able to identify individuals. I don't think that we can, that the party would decide for, for the people, and, and that's what's happening in, in South Africa right now. And personally, I have a problem with that. You have a problem with us uh, getting leadership through the party system, rather try to get individual. How, how, 
doable is that notion when, when you think that at the end of the day, it's not an individual alone who runs the country. Yeah. It's supposed to be a collective of individuals. Yeah. How do those two things reconcile? Well, well, Jimmy, they, 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 they do in the sense that I, I don't think that leadership is just a collective. It's, leadership is also all the things that we spoke about here. Leadership is, is, is humility. Leadership is, is being led. Now, now if, if, if you're going to be chosen from a party, if people say, well, the party decides. I, 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 I'm not, what about the, part, the people that don't belong to that party, who don't see that person as a person that can represent them in leading them? What, what happens to those people? Who, who do they look up to? Or, or who do they lead? Uh, I, I, I'm Morgana, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. It's interesting, revolutionary even. But I really think, I really think it's, she has a point. And party politics really sometimes takes the center stage in any country, in any electorate. Parties want elections, want votes. And votes are done because you're popular. And if you're popular, you will do anything to become popular stay popular. If you're not popular, you want to become popular. <laughs> Individuals, leaders, visionary people, the type of people we want, those are the people, Nelson Mandela is a very good example. Mm. Other presidents in Africa, we've got the president of Rwanda, they are very good examples. People who put party politics aside and say, I'm a leader of a country, I'm leading these people, I'm talking to them, I'm engaging them, I don't care about party politics, not per se, I don't really care, but it's secondary. What comes first is my country, my vision, my people, my continent, my background. And that I think is really important. So it's a revolutionary idea. And I really think <laughs> it could change Africa, really change Africa, really change the world perhaps. Because party politics sometimes brings so many unnecessary issues into people on the, on the streets talk about what they feel, what they experience. And it's not really what's talked about in parliament. Let's be honest about that. People have problems, they have issues, and those things sometimes are not carried all the way up to Parliament. Parliament is focused on party politics. And sometimes we should try to divide that and say, party, no, here aside, and country, take your center stage. Mama Grassa, I saw you uh, <laughs> nodding, shaking. I wasn't and sure no, which I was, it was. I was smiling. <laughs> I was smiling. Well, um, I think I, I would need to. to, to to think deeply if uh, the question is party politics. I'm not so sure because in any system, whether it's a proportional, mm -hmm. which is uh, you elected the party and then the yes, head of the party is the president, or it's other system, it, the, people are organized on the basis of parties. And parties bring uh, a, a, a program mm -hmm. and they bring ideas and plans of what they would like to implement in a certain period. And of course, they are elected on the basis of constituencies, mm -hmm. then individually. Yes. I think that's what South Africa is battling about, whether we should do it that way. But I have seen in African countries where the system is not a proportional, people go directly to constituencies, they are elected, but they buy vo votes. Mm -hmm. They pay people to vote on them. So it's not necessarily the system which is, uh, is the issue here. It, both systems may have, I mean, positive aspects and negative ones. We can look at that. And I think, actually, from my experience with the African peer review mechanism, I think we need to rethink the electoral system in the continent. But that's a different discussion. What I'm saying is that it's not the system itself which is, has become a problem. What has become a problem is personalization of power. People go they ask for votes for themselves and not to go ask for votes to serve the people. It's a question of service, which is, which, which is the major point. So it begins with people and then the party, to serve the party and to serve the friends of the party, mm -hmm. the families of the members of the party, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's the problem. When you say, I have a program, I have a plan which I present to the people, and you go for that, those elections in which you mix with everybody, you embrace elderly, you kiss kids, and you mix with young people. During the campaign, politicians are completely different people 
of uh, who are after they have been elected. You, you just watch. They go in, they <laughs> dance with people, they embrace kids and kisses, etc. Et but once they have been elected, that's when the distance begins. Mm. That's where the distance begins. So I don't think it's the system. It's, it's how people understand that I want to be in parliament, I want to be minister, I want to be president. For what? For whom? What is the end of this question of service for me? I think I'm, I mentioned humility. Second, it's a service, absolute service, to know that I am here because of the people who are uh, in front of me, and I have to measure my success as a result of how I impacted in the lives of those people who have elected. This is one. The second thing I wanted us uh, not, not to concentrate on this discussion is, is that when we talk of leadership, actually, we shouldn't only look at the politicians. Mm -hmm. Let, let's mm -hmm. look also to business. Business are, can be leaders. And to, to, to see how our business leaders or business community, mm -hmm. how do they behave? In which sense they are ultimately concentrated in improving the lives of Africans not only to make money, of course a business person has to make money, but more than making money to know I am committed to social change. And how do I do this? Why do we have many of our business people, for instance, their money is outside and not inside? Mm. Most of their money is in London, is in, uh, U, in, in, in the US, it's everywhere. But the money is not inside the country. What is the profits are not in the country? Why? Because this money were made here, out of resources in our countries, out of the labor and work of Africans. Why then the profits have to be kept somewhere else? It's a question. But it's not only business leaders who do that. Even some politicians also, they keep their monies outside. <laughs> and they are the guardians of our system. So I mean, this question of leadership has to go to everybody politicians, business, religious leaders, traditional leaders, but then also to say the best examples many times of uh, really leadership and service, it's found at community level, but uh, those examples are not brought up. They are not shown as example of how you do. Why community leaders many times, most of them, they are so, because they are really, they live and they are in, entrenched in daily aspirations of the people they are serving. And I will insist in the issue of service. So there's, there's an element of connection here with, within to be deeply rooted and you are within with your people. Second, there's something in terms of humility, I will insist, and service. You are to serve and you measure your success out of how you have been serving, how you have been changing the living standards of your people. Mm -hmm. Bongani, you wanted to say something? I would like to add to that. And I think it's, it's a problem now, and it's a problem in the future. Because we are the youth, we are there, and we're looking at these leaders right now. We want to be involved. Involve us in your families, in your decision making. I'm not saying give us a voice and say, I'm choosing today or what the budget for this month. Involve us, let us participate. We learn, we learn that service because we're involved, we talk to the leaders. Right now I'm sitting on a panel with a former president, a president's wife. That's <laughs> I'm, my goodness that's sake. That's I that's hope that's I'm not sitting here because I'm a pre <laughs> <laughs> somebody's <laughs> wife. I hope. Huh? I apologize, I apologize. I'm not sitting here because I'm a somebody's wife. No, I no, apologize. no, no, of I apologize. course not. I apologize. Thank you. I apologize. Thank you. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> but how many times does this happen in our continent, in our communities? Which leaders sit down with their people? And that is what I'm, I agree with you totally, Mama Marshall. I agree with you. And how many, it should come down to the community level. We are the, part, we are the leaders of the future. And I would like to see that happening down from the very bottom, in schools perhaps, up to the very top. Do, do me, may I ask a question, please? Okay, um, you I can just, ask sorry, a question. Just, so so, so, so just, just to lead to that, I, I mean, it's very easy to criticize Africa 
um, you know, in terms of its leadership. And but we need to have a reflective context to to where we are, what we are right now. I, and I mean, I, I you know, you you you're, you're the conductor here. Uh, I I just I, I just have a problem though at times that we tend to badger and criticize Africa and never go back to where we come from and, 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 and take into account what has happened. I, I look at Tanzania now with the donor funding that it's still dependent on and, and, and I, I ask myself, at what point does it become a self-sustaining organization, right? I look at the former colonized um, countries and, 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 I, and I ask myself, so y you find that, the, the, particularly the, the countries that are very rich in minerals, um, where, where you found the departing colonists wanting to decide who's going to stay leader so that they can continue um, taking away from the resources. So, so that plays into the kind of leadership that you know, we, we, we have a problem with right now. And the question was? The question, <laughs> is, the question is, how much of it should we you know, take into account and, and, and put into this context that we're talking about now? I think, I th you know, without, without sort of giving my opinion, because this mm -hmm. is not my platform mm -hmm. to give an opinion, um, I rather try to, to guide the discussion. I think what's really important and what I would like to see emerging from this conversation is some ideas and, and, and concrete ways in which we can actually begin to effect change. I think that there are many things on this continent where we are challenged. We are challenged when it comes to leadership. We are challenged when it comes to our dependency on aid. We are challenged when it comes to um, some of our leadership be being happy to sell our countries and our resources and effectively our future mm -hmm. um, to people who have no a real interest in the development of this continent. So, so what I'm hoping we can do is begin to talk about the gap, for example, that Mama Grasa identified between people who need to serve or should be serving and how we find those people, nurture those people across the board and allow allow them to become our leaders. That is the conversation that, that I hope we can get to. Otherwise, what we run the risk of doing is having the same conversation we have every year. And every year we talk about all the bad examples on the continent, and this one does this, and this one does that. And I don't think that that actually helps us move forward. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to pick up, and I don't know if, if, you know, if people want to badger, mm -hmm. you know, you, <laughs> you're welcome to, but I'd really encourage us, us not to do that. I'm gonna come to the floor in uh, two more minutes. I just want to, to follow up on that point, Mama, because you made the point about about us needing to identify people who want to serve and bring them to the fore. How do you do that? Because we all understand and see good leadership um, from the community level and even slightly above that. But things seem to go wrong somewhere along the line. And, and, and perhaps we can also go back to President Kappa after you speak so we can understand how we bridge that gap between what happens at the ground and what happens at the more senior level across the communities, from government through business, etc. Actually, I think we should also resist the temptation of painting everybody and say everybody at top level, they are not good leaders. This is not what I was trying to say, at least. We do have good leaders, some. But I think really what's, what needs to change is the leadership, leadership style, if you like. Leadership. We, we, we don't need to, to have... A, I'm, I'm being very blunt, and I have been minister too, so I can, I can, I can feel comfortable <laughs> to say this. Why do you need to have a security guard and a protocol guard and na na na? I mean, throw five people around you, and when you walk, everybody will see someone is coming because there's a whole lot <laughs> of people who show that there's someone important who is, who is coming. There alone, there alone, it creates really a distance between the people and, and our leaders. Why do you need all this? Second, the, 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 I, I again mentioned the issue of uh, constant interaction. Our, our leaders, ministers, whoever, after they have been elected, the number of times then they, went, they go back to communities to sit down in an informal way, without the tie as they do during the campaign, they are with the t-shirts and et cetera, et cetera, but as normal people to mix. This is one. The third is to listen. Listen. And listening is not only to hear, is to take into account what people are saying. 
and to accept criticism when we are not doing well during this period of five years, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we identify? I'm saying some, even as we speak, some do that. And those are the ones we want to keep. And those who believe that a position gives you the right to be so distant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then this is the one we should have a system of saying, you know, Mr. President, mm -hmm. you chose so-and-so to put in that place, but it looks like it's not working. Mm -hmm. Can you please change and keep those we feel we believe? Again, then we come to systems. The systems we have do not allow us to influence change during a certain period. If you have been elected for five years, it's the prerogative of the president alone to remove mm. someone. We, electorate, we have no position mm. on that. Mm. Whether he's serving very badly, he or she, That's but there's no system. We can find a way of whispering to the, eye of the, to the ear of the president to say, so and so is not doing well. Mm. But I think the systems really need to be refined. If people are to serve, then people they, they ha should have an opportunity to say, so-and-so is not serving. Mr. President, please choose somebody else. This is one. The other thing which uh, I believe it's important to take into account also is when you, 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 when you, you are in a position of power as a group, we tend to see people becoming a club and they protect one another. And even when things are not going right, but because I don't want to break the ranks. Many times they talk of breaking ranks. They don't want to break the ranks. And because of that, they will protect one another in the name of the party. And we as people now, we are left out. It's the party which counts. And this group becomes now a club. I think this, this kind of, I don't know whether I should call it leadership style, but this kind of challenges in leadership have to change. Okay. People should not be allowed to become a club against the majority of people mm -hmm. who are you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, actually, in terms of solidarity, it goes beyond the country, even with the neighbors. You, <laughs> you, you try not to upset, mm -hmm. not to upset the neighbor, because tomorrow you will need him to support you there. I think there are lots of uh, ways in which the way of being and of doing business, of leading our countries, which, hey, we need to talk openly and to see where do we change, where do we improve? Okay, President Mkapa, I'd, I'd like for you to, to, to hear some of your thoughts. Uh, Mama Grassa gave some, some really specific examples of where she thinks areas of change uh, and things that need to change in order to, to, to foster more effective leadership. W your thoughts on that? I really, I really don't know. Um, there, are, there are institutions that help good leadership. Politically, you have a legislature, you have political parties. If they are dynamic, they help the leader to be accountable to the people, to implement the party manifesto, to, to get the feedback from the people. That should happen. But on the other hand, the system says that every five years you must go back to the people. If you are in a multi-party system, the, the parties that are not forming the government must give room for the government or the, part, the, the, government, the party in government to effect something before you, you tear them down. Far too often, they don't give that kind of room. And then the, the other factor is that if you have a limitation, as we have in my country, for instance, then you'll be either in a hurry to achieve as much as you can before the 10 years are up, or you'll be very much in a hurry to change the constitution so that you can last a little longer. Not necessarily for selfish reasons, but to realize that there's a time span upon which a, a, pro a program or a manifesto can be implemented. But if you do have those institutions, whether they are political or they are social or they are economic, you know, consumers associations, taxpayers associations, economic, in economic intelligence uh, experts, things like that. If you have those and, you have, and they have access to you, 
you should be able to, 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 lead, to, to lead sensibly, if, as, as I say. You should. But you must be prepared to listen, as you say. And yet, at the same time, they must be prepared to listen to you so that they can be inspired effectively to implement what you are trying to urge. But if you are cutting me short every time I'm trying to explain a <laughs> policy, we won't get anywhere. And that is one of the troubles of multi-party uh, multi -party politics in Africa. But I don't know. I shouldn't get on. <laughs> okay, let me, open, let me open to the floor because I see many, wow, many, many hands. Just um, where are the microphones? Over there and over there. Wow, okay. Um, you had your hand up first, so please go ahead. There's a gentleman right here. And please stand and make sure you introduce yourself and your organization so we know whom we're speaking with. Thank you very much. My name is Alta Pirani. I'm from Tanzania. Uh, I do business, but I also do a little civil society. Uh, when I hear what's happening here, I think it would be fair, as Nkube said, that we need to go back, uh, sorry, Nsibi said, we need to go back 50 years and see what was our history. There were dogmas out there when we got independence. So we had no choice either to support the South or the North. Last 15 years, you can see that generation of leaders, either they've gone away or they've retired. There is a difference in Africa. You can see the leadership. You can see a growth of more than 5% in the last decade. More than average, that is happening globally. So that we have to appreciate the leadership. We should not say the leadership is bad. No, we should appreciate. But I think one of the things that can happen and a way forward would be how do we engage the youth politically into political dialogue? I would give an example of President Obama. I'm a part of his, of his movement. I'm a Tanzanian, but I receive his messages all the time, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, it's uh, reforms on the Wall Street. So I think if we could have a system where our leaders would sit down with youth groups, try to engage them, try to listen, I think I'm sure the next crop of leadership will do exactly what we need to do to move to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think that there's anybody who's going to argue about uh, inclusion of, of youth in, in leadership. I'm going to go over there, and then I'll come to you. Uh, there's a gentleman there. In the th yeah. Good morning. I'm Carl Moyer from DuPont. Um, I wanted to have a question uh, to uh, ask my question to Mr. President. Um, do you, Mr. President, do you think that it is too easy for our leaders to get into power? Because do you think the electoral electorate is too feeble in that they're just easily moved by emotion rather than by issues. So when leaders are campaigning, they do not have to present issues that affect the people. They just have to appeal to the emotion and, and sing and, and you know, rally and uh, then people <laughs> vote you into power. And then obviously you, when you get into power in that way without having it to present any real issues, it's been so easy, then you cannot be a leader. Is, do you think that's an, a, a, a situation? <clears throat> no, I don't think we, we, are, we have, our elections are a competition between emotions. I don't think so. Um, because certainly in my country, we do have political parties. I am not sure that um, there's a great deal of difference in terms of policy between them. Mm -hmm. I hope I'll, I'll be quoted rightly. Mm -hmm. But we do have parties, mm -hmm. and they do come forward with manifestos. And we do have not an ideology, but a national vision, 2025, although I seldom hear it referred to these days, but we do. <laughs> so when we go out to the people, when the parties go out to the people, they do discuss these issues. They, they do discuss them. But the, the determination of who takes the party flag to the people and say, elect me, that is really the monopoly of the political party. And if that is democratic, open, and truly dynamic, we should be able to produce good leaders to, 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 to take the flag to the people and get elected. So I don't think it's a competition of emotions. I think it is a competition, certainly, of articulating policies and targets and objectives. Um, how you arrive at the person who you are going to entrust this task to take to the people is, is the big challenge that I, mm. I, I, I find. <clears throat> 
Okay, and I, and I, I hope that we can actually come up with some ideas and thoughts on, on how we can foster um, a, a better system of, of finding the right people and bringing them to the fore. I think you've all mentioned that, so that would be great. There's a gentleman here with the very dark glasses um, and the pink shirt, <laughs> salmon shirt. Hi, Omar Ben Yedda from uh, African Business Magazine. It's actually something we should just mention about fostering on how to create leadership. Um, basically, in Becky at uh, a, a few years ago, he mentioned that one of the problems with African leadership was that through colonialism, I don't want to go into to colonialism too much, but through colonialism, colonialists destroyed the, the system in Africa by taking away leaders and disrupting the whole system. Therefore, we didn't have that system to create new leaders, saying that we have, uh, we've had Mandela's, we've had, uh, my girlfriend's Mozambican, so she romanticizes about uh, Samora Mashal, saying that he was a visionary leader, he put a value system in place, whereby, for example, corruption was frowned upon in public service. So are those statistical, uh, should I say, in a billion people, you're always going to find a few good leaders, but how do you create the, the leadership system? Has the, value system? has the system been destroyed, or how do you create a new system to create those leaders? Thank you. I would like two people to answer that question, just, if you can just uh, bear with me for a second. Um, Gu, I'd like, I'd like for you to, to look at, um, at that. And Bongani, I'd like to hear your thoughts from a youth perspective of how we can build those systems, as briefly as possible, because as you can see, there are a lot of people who have questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it goes back to what I was saying, that it, it, it's very easy to criticize Africa and its leadership right now, but, but I do think that it's important to take the context and, and remember where we come from. I, I made a point earlier on about colonialism, I mean, where, where you find countries like Gabon, you find, you know, you know where countries that have been rich in resources, where the colonists have moved out, but they've wanted to still maintain power by making sure that they, they, they you know, they influence who the leaders are. I think that we need to break that. I think that we need to change that because um, the power really still resides in, in, in the resources that we have. If, if we don't have control of the resources that our countries have, we will never have leadership leaders that are, uh, don't, don't pay tribute to um, the people that, uh, that have those resources. So, so I, 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 you know, it's, it's not a one-sided um, answer. It's not, it's not just that, but it's, it's a big issue in, in, in our countries right now, in our continent, rather. Okay, um, I would say education and engagement. I, you cannot believe the number of people, young people I've talked to, who are surprised that the Supreme Court can impeach a president. In their minds, the president is above all supreme. End of story. Educate them. They have rights. Educate them how countries work, how systems work. Educate them on what they can and cannot do. A right that you have that you don't know about is useless. And then training them, training young leaders. It's a skill, it's just like music, it's just like art. You train people, go for workshops. And speaking of that, I would just like to propose a, a, an idea. Who trains our leaders? Managers, CEOs go for training sessions. And I'd just like to propose, can we have leaders going for training sessions? <laughs> Leadership sessions, training skills, empower them with skills. It's something that can be taught, I believe that. I have been taught and I'm learning and I think it's something education never ends. Very, very interesting thoughts. Uh, there is a lady here in uh, a green jacket, but first this gentleman in the front. Yeah, good morning. My name is Nana Naude. I'm from Nigeria. I, I want to talk a bit about uh, practical steps that can be taken to reverse the, to bridge the leadership gap. And I strongly believe that we need to be pragmatic and uh, we need to use what we have to get
we do a census of how many people who are, who are in political parties now. When we come again next year, we see how many of us have joined. And you'll see the change. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. The lady in the green jacket we'd highlighted. Go ahead. Um, thank you. My name is Shola David Bora. I work for Standard Bank Group in Nigeria. My question is on succession. And I'd like um, Mama Michelle and President Makaba to maybe give a response. How do leaders ensure that the right successor comes, takes over from them? You know, despite all the pressures, all the challenges, how do they make sure that the wrong person does not take over from them? I think that's very critical. And many times you find out by handing over to the wrong person, it negates all the progress that um, a country has made. Thank you. No, I'm coming this side. Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you want, you want me to call? Yes. It is for me. Oh, okay. When I think, uh, I agree with the, with the idea that we have to live with the reality that political parties are, at least for now, the system through which we can, I mean, not only present a program and a plan, a manifesto, and to get elected, that's fine. I think we need. My problem is simply that within political parties, we need to improve the way. Again, it's the question of leadership style. The, the, the way political parties can now, if I come to, to, to respond to, you, to your question, it's not to choose one. I think you begin by having a crop, a group of the best you have in your party. And then the preparation of this succession is through this group, the best among them. Then among the best, it will emerge the one who is the best to lead the team. I think this is the way we should go as Africans. So it's not the prerogative of uh, the incumbent president to choose uh, a successor. It's to prepare a young generation. And generation, it doesn't mean necessarily in age, but I'm saying, young people, new people to take over, but as a group in which you identify the kind of skills, the kind of, uh, of, uh, of expertise, the kind of, uh, you would like to take the country as a party, to take the country forward. And among them, the best will emerge. And they will also feel the strength of moving as a group. So I think we need to, to have in each political party, we should have those systems which help us to identify who are they, I'm saying they, in our group. And we, we transfer part of our experience, because that's another thing which I would like to mention because of, of, of young people. There's no any guarantee that because you are 40 years younger than I am, when you get a position do, 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 of, 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 of power, you'll be better than me. It's not, it's not, it's not automatic it's just simply because you are much younger. Second, I would insist that it's very important to have this training so that you are much better prepared to be a leader than it was in my time when I was in position of power. But the fact that you are trained, it doesn't give you immediately the right to believe that you are leader. I think there's a risk because of these many programs of leadership training and all of these young people, they will grow believing that they are leaders. No, you will have to be tested to be a leader. It's when you work and work hard, again, I'll insist, you produce results. Mm -hmm. And people then, they'll say, you are a leader. What you are being given is the tools of how you can manage your principled life, the value systems you have, how do you manage that? And it will help you to eventually emerge as a leader. So all those, these trainings which exist are extremely important, but the leadership will have to emerge. We have to be careful that they don't begin to become so um, arrogant, I'm very blunt, arrogant to believe that they are the leaders of tomorrow and they will be necessarily, they will be doing better. Get your hands dirty, work hard, prove yourself, and then you'll emerge as a leader. But I don't know whether I did respond to the question which you, you, you asked. I think really succession processes have to be institutionalized 
they have to, the political parties have to have ways in which they identify new people, among them young and women, to prepare for the next wave of those who are going to take the helm of the country. And among themselves, not only within the party, but society at large should be able to look at someone and say, mm, yeah, he is or she is the one. So that it's not an option which is depends on a small group to decide who is who, because then if we don't develop a sort of uh, empathy, we as people, empathy with that person as a leader, from the beginning, then there is a distance. We will not work well. I have, I, have little, I have little to add to what she said. I can only give you our own experience here, in my party, that is. There is a clear process by which leaders emerge, um, and they are discussed at every level, uh, from the, the party branch to the district level, to the regional level, and ultimately the national level. And at the national level, the, monitor, uh, the vetting is extremely rigorous, I can assure you. It's extremely rigorous. Now, whether as a result we get good leaders or not, I don't know. The other example I'll give you is that we have, for instance, for the legislature, we have a system in our party for primaries. But the last time we had an election, we said, listen, we must try to get as many uh, women elected from constituencies as it is possible, because otherwise they would have to come out of a national list. And, and, and in, in at least three instances, we had the women taking the number two position in the primary. And so we had to approach the members who had taken the first position in the primary to say, look, will you step aside because we think that this candidate who is a woman in order to increase the gender balance in parliament mm -hmm. should stand in, in the name of our party. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, all the three of them got elected, thank God. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's another way in which you, 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 you expand the leadership and also improve on the quality. Now, Tommy, may I ask my, my retired yes, leader here, Prime Minister Warioba, he has shown his hand. He might help to disabuse you of all these things I've been telling <laughs> you about. Yes, he was the vice, vice president. The vice president of Burundi also Thank you, thank you, Mr. Here. President, for rooting for me. <laughs> <laughs> While I have been listening, I think uh, Mama Michelle has been emphasizing something which we ought to take note of. When I was young and a bit uh, radical, there was a process of electing the, cons uh, the leader of the Conservative Party in Britain. And the party leader said, you wait, a leader will emerge. And we thought that was conservative. A leader should be elected by the people. Why are these people saying he will emerge? But later on, I found our process is actually leaders emerge. And that's how we had leaders like Nyerere, Mandela, and so on. They sacrificed, they dated their hands, and they were recognized. The election was a process of recognizing that these were leaders. But now we are in a transition. In a transition in the sense that we have put much emphasis on the procedures and mechanisms mm. rather than recognizing who are the leaders. That is the problem we have. We are going through a transition. And I think what the two elders have said, we ought to build the parties. The political parties represent value. They have policies. And if people are going to judge, they want to choose a political party because of the values, then that political party should be in a position to know the leaders which, who are acceptable to the people. These, these days, I think leaders are a, a project, or, a, or you can say, a, you, you have a project of getting leaders. You go through this, if you are good at procedures, you can emerge as a leader. If you're good, you can manipulate the procedures of being nominated then I think when you go to the people, it's a fair complete. You have been elected by procedure, yeah. not by the wish of, uh, wishes of the people. So I think we should focus now. How do we reform so that you get a system through parties where leaders emerge? Thank you.
Thank you very much. My name is Joe Winfo from uh, KPMG, Ghana. Uh, I've heard Madam uh, Michelle, and I've also heard the two youngsters. And I think from the way the two youngsters, youngsters actually yes, yes. came out, Thank you I, I have some hope in Africa that I think we can make it. I agree that what we have now is a political system. Our major problem, and I'm not going to talk about leadership in business because that is not a major issue for Africa's development. So I'm going to talk about a political leadership. And although I come from a country where we've been congratulated by the, by the world for having a free and fair election, I still agree with uh, the young lady and the young man that the actual leaders we want, who will actually move the countries forward, are not necessarily those that emerge as leaders. Because our system now, the political system now, is more of an investment. The campaigns are very expensive. And maybe coming from my background, we are able to estimate the cost of the campaigns. They become sophisticated. We are in Africa where we don't have the Obama who can get $20 from school children. We are in a continent where you have to pay the voters. You have to find money for the T-shirts. And whether politicians are going to sell their houses to finance this, or businesses are going to finance this, no business will finance that without expecting a return. So immediately the one is elected, they've got to start counting the cost of repayment. They've got to pay back. Then you have these patronage appointments where people with no capacities, capabilities, are appointed as ministers because it's a, a reward system. You end up with contractors who are coming back for the payback. The shoddy jobs will be done at high cost because you've got to finance the party to try and come back. Mm -hmm. So really, the question is, is it the party system that we have which is flawed? And remember that we imported this. Maybe that is why we were commended by Obama and the Western countries that we've been good students. Mm -hmm. And that we've done exactly what they've been doing to prove that their system is what should be universally accepted. Maybe we've got to examine that now mm -hmm. and find out. I believe that our leaders started talking about state funding of political parties. Then I realized they were filling the page. They were realizing that the payback was becoming expensive. It was going to take away those uh, fundamental qualities that Madam Michelle enumerated here. So we can find a way to arrive at that. Maybe we have to start from our small constituencies and then start a selection process without necessarily the parties. Okay, thank you very much. I do have to stop you there because we literally have 10 more minutes to go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to only be able to take two more questions, so one on that side and one on this side. And then I'd like our, our panelists to make some comments and then we can talk about some of the potential solutions that have been identified thus far. This lady has been insisting. And then... Jimmy, I'm pleased I've had the opportunity. I think um, quite a few uh, you know, very good thoughts expressed. I think uh, you know, Gugu, your, uh, your thoughts need to be looked at because everybody's uh, given their views in terms of how leaders are elected and we're not saying it's perfect. For me, one of the issues is between a campaign election and the next campaign and election, there seems to be a void. Now, whether you're in the corporate sector or whether you're in the public sector, there's such a thing as monitoring and evaluation. And right now, the system doesn't monitor or allow the electorate to monitor and evaluate the very people that they've put into office, save for the period between one election and the other. And one of the things to do is to monitor and evaluate and performance manage leaders that have been put into office 
at different periods within that term. And I think that that really needs to be looked at. I just want to make a, qu a comment, and I, and I don't know whether sort of I'm off the, the, the mark here, but one of the challenges that, 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 uh, that we face, even in performance, there are many leaders who their own electorate will look at them and say, you're not performing. We know you're not performing. We can see you're not performing. The challenge is the ability to ask them to say, you need to now step aside. So I don't know whether it's a challenge of monitoring or evaluating what they're doing or addressing the system that we have that allows them to continue doing what they are doing or not doing. And I think that that is perhaps the, 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 the issue that I'm hearing. And from what I've heard in talking about systems, it's looking at the systems that we have and whether they in fact are working for us. And there are many people who will say, it seems not, because we can't get people who are not performing to move. You know, we can cite numerous examples across the continent. One more co question, I think, from this side. Um, there is... A I'm sorry. Oh. The, the Vice President of Burundi had asked to speak. I'm sorry, I didn't see his hand. Did you, he, did you he raise did, your hand? He did. I'm sorry. I'm and sorry, Mr. President. Okay. No, no. no, please. It was it's Zanzibar. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not see your hand. I apologize. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Go madam. Ahead. What I would like to say, I'm a bit confused when I listen to Madam Gresham Misawas inside a uh, leadership orientation. Managerial competence are not sufficient. Somebody must have certain kind of experience in order to emerge as a leader. But then I ask people like uh, former president and the late Nyerere, or Mze Mandela, how did they emerge as a leader? Because they must start somewhere whereby they didn't have much experience. So I'm a bit confused. I think somebody must have somewhere. And another question is, I have read the book of uh, famous novelist in Nigeria, uh, Achebe, about how, uh, what's wrong with Nigeria. He said, there's nothing wrong with Nigeria because the food, there's nothing wrong with the food, there's nothing wrong with the air, they breathe. But the failure of leadership. So, you, the panelists, can you just tell us or identify the factors which make the Africans are not good leaders? Because as we see the situation, for example, in Asia, we have dynamic and capable leaders who have been able to move their country forward, America, Europe. But the African continent is the only continent on earth which is the poorest. So can we identify or locate some of the factors which have made us to be a poor leader comparing with other continents. Thank you. Should I? Uh, I may have uh, made my comments a bit confusing, but I, 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 don't, I didn't mean necessarily that you don't need training. There's one thing I didn't emphasize, which I would like to emphasize here. It's values. Values. And value system under which you emerge as a leader. And again, the issue of political parties, many mm -hmm. of our political parties actually, they were built in a solid, solid set of values. And these are the values which if I heard rightly, Prime Minister uh, Warioba saying, we, we, we put aside the values and we concentrate on procedures. And because you can use procedures, then you can undermine values. I think any as a political party, as individual, people have to conduct themselves within a very, very clear set of values, which we call value system. This is, this is one. And this is what made the best of the examples you mentioned here, Malimu, Nyerere, and others. It's precisely because there were people who conduct themselves rigorously within these principles and these values. And that's what I think we should re recap. The second thing, <coughs> Prime Minister, I think, you, you, you mentioned is uh, why, for instance, Asian countries are successful. I think there's something very quickly, I'm sorry. We Africans, we have to recapture our sense of, uh, of identity, of the values which identify my Africanness. It's not simply because I was born black 
or I was born in this region of the globe. What makes us Africans, and we have a thorough set of values of how we are. One of them, which is extremely important, it, it relates to service for me, is that an African never identifies himself as individual. You identify yourself within a social structure in which you are bound always to look at yourself, but in looking around that system. We shouldn't allow this to break. We can. And some of the reasons why East societies are, is because they keep their value systems. The Japanese are very developed, but they are very much Japanese. The, the, the Chin Chinese, the Indians, they keep their value systems very strong. We Africans, maybe because of the colonialism or other reasons, we are very easy to imitate others and abandon our own soul. So you need to be rooted in your own soul. You need to be able, also, you need to be able to develop a sense of dignity and present yourself with dignity so that people will respect you. Sometimes you really feel so bad by the way we Africans, we sell ourselves and we forget that I have to present myself with dignity, with self-respect so that others will respect me. And I think this, in these issues of values, the kind of values maybe we would need to discuss more. But it was just to, to bring this before I, you don't, you can take my last comments as this one so that I give others, sorry. No, Mama, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think many of us agree with, 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 with your sentiments. Um, perhaps if I could go to, to, to Gugu and then Bongani and then give Mr. President the last word and then just quickly wrap up. So Gugu, All go right. ahead. Thank you. I, I just think that sometimes as Africans we are our own worst enemies. I think that we work against ourselves too often. Um, and I, and I, I'm quite optimistic, call me naive for being that. I don't think it's all gloom and doom uh, with our African leaders. I think that we have very apt leaders in certain areas and I think that it's also up to us to support them and challenge them. I think too often we sit very comfortably in our homes uh, and, 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 and have these private dinner conversations where we criticize, but, but, but we never speak out because I suppose for whatever reason that you, know, you won't get that tender if you are seen to be speaking out, but it's, it's speaking truth to power. And I think in speaking truth to power is when you challenge your leaders. Um, so so, so let's, not, let's not be duplicitous and be uh, disingenuous and, and, and be able to sit in our, in our, in our wonderful homes and, and have those private conversations and, not, and yet not come out and speak. Um, you, you spoke about the issue of monitoring and evaluation. I, I, I think that, that yes, we need that, but I think I would want it to be independent because um, if you have a monitoring and evaluation that's not independent, that's, that's set up by the very same people that you're supposed to evaluate, I don't see how far that will go. I, you know, the independence issue is, is very critical for me. Um, you know, we, we, we suffer from a problem of, of our elites not serving the community as well. So for me, our elites are not just the politicians, it's also um, you know, our business people, uh, the people done, you know, that, that could make a difference in our lives. We, we, we find that they, they don't participate and they don't assist and they don't, they're not part of the community um, and maybe they don't need to be. Um, before I, yeah, I think that's... Okay. Thanks, Gugu. Mama Michelle, talking about values has remind, reminded me of a saying in my language, inkosi, inkosi ngabantu. And she said the other day that it's not either or, it's and, and. Leaders need to be taught, the people need to be taught, and a leader should be a leader of oneself, first of all. Leaders should be leaders of themselves in their lives, in their families, and they need to be dealt with. And the population that they are leading needs to be dealt with at the same time. And I'm part of that population. Deal with me, people, please. I'm asking you, deal with me. And I want, because this is a system, and each part affects the other part, we need to engage ourselves holistically and look at everything in light of the global picture. We want an African leadership. We want an African identity. We want something that we can hold on to and say it's ours. And that, I think, is what we need to create. Can I just Oh, sorry. So do we, you yes. know, sorry, I, you know, in my rush not to take, you know, sometimes I think I love the sound of my voice as small as it is. But I think that it, what is not sustainable for me is 
again, going to the point where you, you, you live in Sandhurst and barely two kilometers, there's an Alexander of slums. It's, it's not sustainable. Uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm passing this on as a challenge. In, in all our, our countries, in, as, as Africa, Africa as a continent, it is not sustainable to have our people living in the kind of areas that they live in, and we continue living in our plush homes, pretending as if we can't see that. Good, well, thank you very much. Um, Mr. President, if I could give you the last word, please. Oh, I hope it's not the last word. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, 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 I will only add this. First, I underscore the, the, the fact of, um, or rather the imperative of character in addition to charisma for leadership, really. Because character is what inspires and character is what commands loyalty. You know, it, 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 come, it does that. It's important. Two, um, provide for a regular periodic, if you like, review of the institutions of governance. Um, legislature or the political parties and their relationship Re regularly. It may be five years, 10 years, 15 years, but there must be a review to give hope that change is possible. Mm. Thirdly, now, what was my third one? I don't know, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> my third one is really encourage creativity in the, in the, in the population. Feedback. C people who are prepared to not only to inquire, but also to venture, because that's the problem. And it's difficult to do this in, in, our, in our societies, because everyone depends so much on the state. The trader will, not, will know that without the tender, he can't get very far. Without that license, he can't get very far. And, and the, in, the dependence on the state for livelihood and so on really limits, limits the influence of the general citizenry and certainly of the business community in influencing the leadership into, into, chosen, into chosen, path, chosen paths. Finally, you know, you, we must recognize that we are, in the, we, are, we are in the process of nation building and it requires, it requires different caliber of leadership. It was easy for, for the independence struggle to get that, but that was really getting independence and we went nations at independence, really. Everyone acknowledges that. And the task of nation building really requires a great deal of encouraging empathy among a very diverse society, I mean, diverse communities into one shared society. If that can be understood and pursued, I think we have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've all heard um, some ideas and very specific thoughts on what can be done in order to affect change and to support the good leadership that we have on the continent, but of course foster the growth of young leaders coming up through the ranks. The challenge, I suppose, at the end of this session is that you pick one thing that's been suggested by our panelists, one thing, and look at how you as leaders in your own right, in your business communities, in your communities as polit pol political leaders, can affect change using just that one example. Whether it's the system issue, whether it's fostering nation building, whether it's uh, encouraging uh, a, a cohesiveness in all of us being African. Pick one thing, and I'd like to see how we can continue this conversation in a year's time and move forward rather than having the same conversation again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention.